I really enjoyed this series that we're in. Pastor Ed talked last week about hope for the weary. And, um, you know, so we just learned about how Jesus invites us to find rest in him when we're weary and burdened and how we can share those burdens with other people in the church so that we don't have to walk alone. And so uh, that's where hope is found in our relationship with the Lord and in our relationship with other believers who can encourage us and lift us up. And the truth is we all are in need of hope at one point or another in our lives. And um, so perhaps for you, you don't need hope because you're tired and weary, but maybe you need hope because you feel broken. And so that's what we're going to talk today. We're talking about hope for the broken. And sometimes, like in the Bible story we're going to read today, sometimes our brokenness is a result of our own choices. Sometimes, um, you know, our choices have not sometimes, always, our choices have consequences <laughs> for the good or for the bad. And so sometimes when we experience brokenness, it's a result of our own sin, right? But we've all made mistakes. We've all fallen into sin. We've all experienced that at some point. And when that happens, there is like a breaking sometimes. You know, there's a breaking of relationship. There can be a breaking in your marriage, or um, you could lose a job, or, you know, have struggles in your finances or something um, because of a result of our own choices. And so when when you get to that point, you just feel broken and hopeless, you know. um, I mean, I think that's the point where we all kind of recognize how badly we need Jesus. (laughs) And um, sometimes, you know, when you're at that point, it just feels like, God, where are you? You know, you just feel like abandoned by God. But the truth is the Bible tells us that God's close to the brokenhearted. And um, so I want to encourage you today that God is here. Jesus is here to give you hope, even in the midst of really difficult circumstances, whatever that may be that you're dealing with. Sometimes you feel judged by the people around you, you know, and you, and you need freedom from that. And sometimes when our sin is exposed, um, all we feel is shame and guilt, you know. Um, but But when your sin is exposed, that doesn't have to be the end of your story. Because if you have Jesus living on the inside of you, then it's really just the beginning. He He's given you an opportunity for a fresh start. And because Jesus is here, hope is here. Y'all say that with me. Because Jesus is here, hope is here. Hope is here. Jesus really can mend anything that's broken. There's nothing too bad, too big, nothing, no pain you've experienced in your past or no sin that you've committed that's too big for Jesus to heal. He really can do anything. He's great at turning situations around. He's great at giving victory where you've only experienced defeat in the past. And he's really great at healing broken hearts. So the story that we're going to read today is about a woman who knew exactly what it felt like to be broken and in need of restoration. It takes place in John chapter 8. If y'all would stand up on your feet with me to honor God's word as we read it together. John chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you that you care about people who are broken. 
Thank you, Lord, that you value us and love us so much that even when we sin, you still came to redeem us, Lord. Your word says that you demonstrated your great love for us and in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, and we thank you for that, Lord. We ask you for your Holy Spirit today, Lord, that you said that it, it, it's the Holy Spirit that sets people free. Lord, we ask you for your Holy Spirit today to be in this room to heal every kind of brokenness, Lord. I ask you to use me, to speak through me. Lord, I submit my mind and my mouth to you today, and I ask that you would use my words, Lord, to touch people's hearts, to bind up the brokenhearted in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Okay, so this woman, um, she's brought before everyone with the accusation that she'd been caught in the act of adultery. So she was cheating on her husband with someone else, and these men apprehended her in the middle of the scandal. Can you imagine how embarrassing and mortifying and humiliating that would be? And uh, she would, and now, like, this is not a, mar- a sermon on marriage, okay? So stick with me here. This is a sermon on brokenness because of our sin, you know? So she was caught in the act, and she was broken and humiliated. And um, she would have been fully aware that the consequences for her sin, according to Mosaic Law, would, were that she was to be stoned to death. And she knew that whenever, whenever the men, the religious people, started dragging her out of that house to Jesus wherever she was. And so <clears throat> this, this is a picture of a broken person right here. I mean, this is like rock bottom <laughs> for somebody, you know, and um, she's a, she has a broken marriage, she's a broken woman, she's got a broken reputation, I would imagine she felt pretty hopeless that, that first of all, she would survive the day, and second of all, that she could ever have any kind of a good future, you know, I imagine she was pretty, pretty hopeless, so that's point number one, is like this woman, we have all experienced brokenness at some point. And sometimes brokenness is a result of our own sin, but sometimes we experience brokenness because of somebody else's sin, or sometimes we experience brokenness because of circumstances that are beyond our control, that we have no control over, you know. But but we have all experienced brokenness at one point or another, and probably will again (laughs) at one point or another. Have to go through some hard things, you know, because we live in in a fallen world. But Jesus always gives us hope that he, d- he doesn't want to leave us in the brokenness. So, so what is m- one of the most shocking things about this woman in this story to me is that she was really being used as a pawn in the religious leader's uh, quest to get rid of Jesus. I don't know how much they really cared about her sin they just wanted to shame her, and they wanted to trap Jesus. And so, um, you know, she, her sin was being exploited in front of everyone in order to harm Jesus. And so this woman was caught in the middle with her sin exposed. And, um, you know, when that happens to us, it sometimes is the worst feeling possible, probably, always. You know, when, when our sin has found us out, that's a bad feeling. But... It's also a wonderful feeling because, on one hand, it's terrible because everybody knows the truth about you. And on the other hand, it's wonderful because everybody finally knows the truth about you. And you have an opportunity now to make a change and to move forward in your life, to, to make a fresh start. So here she was, caught in adultery and laying before Jesus, and she had lost all hope that she was going to be able to avoid death or be able to have a good future, but Jesus intervened. And he does that in all of our lives. Can you remember a time when Jesus stepped in, when he intervened in your life? Anybody? We've got two people who can remember when Jesus stepped in. Amen. He does. He, he intervenes in our lives. Thank goodness. So rather than agree with this woman's death on account of the law, Jesus does something different. The Bible says that he stoops down and he begins to write in the sand. And we don't know what he was writing. Lots of people have speculated. But basically, they don't know. Nobody knows what he was writing in the sand. He could have been writing... 
people's names. He could have been writing people's sins. He could have been writing, I'm super awesome. I mean, it could have been anything. We don't know. And it would have been the truth, right, if he wrote that. But So we don't know what he was writing in the sand. But when the mob was pushing him for an answer, he stood up and he told them, feel free to proceed with stoning this woman. But let the, the one of you that has not sinned, let him be the first one to throw a stone at her. And so, you know, he's talking to religious people here. He's talking to people who are supposed to love God and follow him, you know. And so that is point number two is the church is a place of hope. So if we're going to be like Jesus, if we're going to be the church of Jesus Christ, we can't be the kind of religious people that shame people in their sin. We got to be the kind of people that take them by the hand and walk them to Jesus. We got to be the kind of people that give people grace and mercy because we recognize how much grace and mercy we need ourselves. And, um, you know, I, I really truly believe that's the heart of Generations Church. We're so good. Y'all are so good at walking with broken people and trying to connect them to Jesus. And you know, all of the outreaches that we do, Surrender the Secret and Embrace Grace, and um, all of those things are designed to meet people in the middle of their brokenness and to help them connect with Jesus. So I really do believe Generations Church is a church that's a place of hope for people. So, as important as it is for a sinner to respond correctly when their sin has been found out, it's equally important for the church to respond correctly to a sinner, you know? And so we receive hope in the midst of our brokenness when, when we acknowledge we've all fallen short. We, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what Romans 3.23 says. So the beauty of the fellowship of the church is that we're able to extend forgiveness and grace to one another because we recognize how much we need it ourselves. And so Jesus Jesus is making a point here. He's trying to teach the religious people, the self-righteous people, the people that have done everything that they could to follow the law all of their lives. He's trying to teach them about grace and mercy here. And um, if you if you cannot throw a stone at this woman, it's because you're guilty of breaking the law yourself. So these men, one by one, they drop their stones and go home. And I think one of the interesting details that we get about this story is that it was the old men that left first. And, um, you know, I think maybe the older men, they had a better understanding of just how how much they needed grace and forgiveness themselves. They had a better understanding of their own sin, you know. And eventually the younger, maybe more stubborn men left as well until it was only this woman and Jesus left. And I can imagine Jesus looking at this woman with compassion and love, you know. And um, he, said, I don't, he said, I don't condemn you. And so for the first time in this woman's brokenness, maybe she felt a little hope. And Jesus is the only one in the story who doesn't condemn her for her mistakes. He's the only one who doesn't want to punish her, who doesn't want justice for her, you know. But Jesus offers her grace. And, you know, just like Jesus offered her grace, he offers that to us as well, that his, his word over you is love, that um, the truest thing about you that you need to know is that you are loved by God and and he loves you no matter what. He doesn't place value on you because of your good decisions or how well your performance is or how much money you make or who your family is or you know any your social status anything like that. He values you because he made you and he loves you and so our hope is found in a God who loves us just the way we are but loves us too much to leave us there. <laughs> he does love us just the way we are. While, while we were still sinners, he died for us. But he also wants us to get victory over the things in our lives, over the sin in our lives that have been holding us back and keeping us broken. 
And so um, Jesus clearly does not condone the, whim, the woman's sin. In fact, he tells her, the last words he says to her are, go and leave your life of sin. Or another translation you may have heard says, go and sin no more, right? Uh, Jesus care, he does care about how we live our lives. And he cares about the decisions that we make that leave us broken and that hurt other people. And, um, but he wants to expose our sin, not for the same reason as the Pharisees did. He wants to expose our sin so that we can be free. Uh, Pastor Stephen Furtick says it this way. He says, God exposes sin not to shame us, but to change us. He wants us to be free. I, I have heard it said, and I do believe it's true, that God will deal with you privately about your sin. But if you refuse to repent, if you refuse to listen to him, then he has no choice but to bring your sin into the light so that you can be set free. And that's always his heart for you. When he exposes our sin, it's out of love because he wants us to be free. He wants us to have a fresh start, you know. So, um... These men expose this woman's sin to shame her and to trap Jesus, but Jesus exposes sin for a different reason. He, he exposes it because he wants to make us whole. He wants to take the broken pieces and put them back together. And that's point number three today. God puts the broken pieces back together. So I have good news for you today if you find yourself broken, if you feel like you're surrounded by people who want to throw stones at you, that Jesus will meet you here in this place because hope is here. And Jesus can heal every broken heart, no matter the circumstances of your life, no matter what caused your wound, how bad it was, Jesus can heal every broken heart. He can heal every broken thing on the inside of you. If your brokenness was not caused by your own sin, but by other people or by circumstances beyond your control, then I've got good news for you today. Jesus is here, and there's always hope with Jesus. And Jesus himself said when he, remember the story about when he was walking into the synagogue, and he picked up a scroll to read it, and he happened to pick up um, the book of Isaiah. And what he read was a prophecy about himself from Isaiah 61, and it said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor to bind up the brokenhearted and proclaim freedom for the captives that's what Jesus does for us he's here for us today to bind up broken hearts and to proclaim freedom for the captives and and the word poor there doesn't mean like um, poor in money it means like poor in spirit people who are just down and out you know he wants to preach the good good news to you he wants to give you hope that he's got a better future planned for you worship team if y'all would go ahead and come on up so if your brokenness is because of great loss i understand grieving and and nobody can tell you how long is an acceptable amount of time to grieve but I am here to tell you today that it is not God's plan for you, for your life, for you to stay in a state of brokenness and grieving forever. And um, if you will look with me at the scripture from 1 Samuel 16, 1, I heard the scripture in a message by Jensen Franklin recently, and it stuck with me, and it's, and it's so powerful. And I'll kind of explain what's going on uh, um, after we read it. But 1 Samuel 16, 1 says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. So what's happening in this verse is Samuel the prophet had been led by God to anoint Saul as king over Israel. The Israelites begged for a king. They wanted to be like everybody else. They begged for a king. So, so Saul anoint, I'm sorry, Samuel anointed Saul as king over Israel, and Saul did not obey God. Saul turned his back on God. He started out good, but he didn't finish very well. He started going to um, witchcraft and trying to get answers some other way than going to God. And so, so God said, I'm sorry, but you can't be king anymore. 
He wanted to anoint somebody who was going to follow him with her whole heart. And so Samuel was grieving. This probably felt like a failure to Samuel. Hello, he's the one that chose this king for Israel, even though he was led by God. And so he was grieving. And he was probably also grieving for Saul, like a father does for a child who's not following the Lord. You know, he's Saul's grief, or Samuel's grieving that Saul's not following God. But also, it probably felt like he just missed it. You know, probably just felt like, how did I mess this up so badly, Lord? And so Samuel is in, in the middle of just grieving. And we don't know how long he was grieving, but we do know the Lord says to him, how long are you going to mourn? So I'm here to tell you today that it, it is never God's plan to leave you in a perpetual state of mourning and brokenness, no matter what has happened to you in your life. Notice what the Lord said to Samuel in, in chapter 16. He said, fill your horn with oil. That was the anointing oil. He'd already, he'd already put the anointing oil on Saul, but God told him, do it again. Fill your horn with oil. Get ready to go and anoint, anoint the new king. And, and he told him, I have provided. And, you know, I think he's saying that to us today, too. I have provided. Get up and go. I've, I've provided. I've provided Jesus for your healing. I've given you the church body to lift you up and encourage you whenever, whenever you need somebody holding you up, you know. So if we want God to heal our brokenness, if we don't want to stay in mourning, we've got to put some things into action. We've got to put our, uh, some feet to our faith, you know. We've got to get up and start putting one foot in front of the other. And when I was a kid, I, I grew up in the country, and we learned, it was just my sister and I, I have an older sister, and we learned how to work hard from an early age. And, um, you know, if there was anything that needed to be done, we did it. We, if the lawn needed to be mowed, we mowed it. One of us, one week, we would trade off. One would mow, one would weed eat every week. If the garden needed to be hoed, we hoed it. If the spinach needed to be picked, if you've never had to spinach, pick spinach, it's terrible. It's, the, that's like the worst job ever. You can't ever get a bushel of spinach. It just keeps like getting smaller and smaller, it seems like. Uh, but if the field needed to be plowed, we plowed it. If the oil needed to be changed in a vehicle, we were right there with my dad changing the oil. We were, if, if a barn needed to be built, we were learning how to use a welder and building a barn. And, you know, um, so I kind of grew up uh, just learning. My dad expected us to be tough, you know. And um, that was an expectation that I felt, I felt very strongly like, well, all growing up, I just felt like we just had to suck it up and deal with it. Suck it, suck it up and deal with it. And I still feel that way to, in a lot of things. There's lots of times I'd like to say to somebody, suck it up and deal with it, you know. Um, I know none of you have never felt like that before. But, um, <laughs> yeah, my dad used to say, if you're not bleeding, you shouldn't be crying. And... Um, that was maybe somewhat funny, but not really. He, I think he really meant that, you know. He, he wanted us to be tough, but so I learned to just suck it up and deal with it. But I did that emotionally too, you know. Whenever I faced hard things, I just sucked it up and dealt with it and moved on with life, you know. And so um, when Jeff and I got married, we've been married 17 years now. And the first four years were like hell. For real I mean it was our relationship was so volatile and um, we were I mean verbally we it felt like we were having a knockdown drag out fight every day of the week and um, I was just tired I didn't see any way that our lives were gonna get any better and I was I was broken and, uh, you know, we just kept hurting each other, and we didn't know. We, were, we both were saved. We both were doing our best to serve God, you know, but we were broken. And um, so one day we'd been having a fight, and I don't even know what it was about, but one day I told Jeff, I just want to be dead. 
and I think he knew me well enough to know I don't say things I don't mean. I meant that wholeheartedly. I just wanted to be dead. And, you know, I was never um, suicidal, but I did ask God many times, please kill me. Kill me now. Because <laughs> um, it didn't feel like our marriage was going to get, I just didn't see any other way out. I mean, we tried everything, you know. And so um, I think that scared Jeff because he he recognized that I don't say things that I don't mean. And so he sat me up on the counter of our kitchen that day and he said, you know, I think your whole life you have just been told you're tough and suck it up and deal with it. And um, that you've never learned how to trust God with your heart. And you know, he was right which was surprising because at that point in our lives, I didn't think he was right about anything. But he was right. I had never learned how to trust God with my heart and with my brokenness. And so um, one day I was driving to church, and I remember I was just praying and pouring out my heart to God. And, um, and the Lord said to me, in my heart, I heard the Lord say, I have loved you with an everlasting love, Lacey. And so I knew that was a scripture. I didn't remember where it was. I went and looked it up. It comes from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 3 through 4. It says, The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. I will build you up again, and you will be rebuilt, O virgin Israel. Again, you will take up your tambourines and go out to dance with the joyful. And God was speaking hope to me. You know, he was telling me that he was going to build me up again, that I wasn't going to just live in this state of brokenness forever, that I was going to get to a place of joy again when I couldn't imagine that in any way at that point in time. And so what I started doing was going into my prayer closet, and I do pray in my closet because it's the only place that I'm safe from children and dogs in my house. So I pray in my closet, and I would get in my closet and just say, Lord, I'm not protecting my heart from you. And, you know, I'd gotten to the point where I did, I felt like it was scary to trust my heart to God because, listen, I was just barely holding it together as it was, you know. <laughs> and um, But I had to get on my knees and say, Lord, I'm not protecting my heart from you. I trust you, and you're faithful, and I recognize that you're good. And I, and I need you to heal my heart again, Lord. And, and I started doing that every time I experienced a hurt or a brokenness. And you know what? It didn't take very long for the Lord to really heal my heart. But I had to learn how to trust him. And I had to learn how to trust God with Jeff and with my marriage. You know, and that um, felt like it changed things I feel like that was the turning point in our marriage when really, instead of going to Jeff and griping about all of the things that I didn't think he was doing right, I I had to start going to God and saying, God, I trust you. I trust you to deal with Jeff. I trust you to make this right. I trust you to show me what I need to do, my next step, my my attitude, what I need to do to be reconciled to him. And so learning how to trust God with my heart and my brokenness and my life changed everything for me. And it, it one, for me, feels like it was the turning point in our marriage. But my circumstances didn't change overnight. But my heart did. I, I was able to deal with the things in my marriage in, in a healthy way instead of just feeling like I was broken and just limping through life all the time. You know, things did not get better in my marriage overnight. But I do, I felt like I wasn't limping through life anymore. You know, and God can do that for you too. He wants to heal every kind of brokenness. Those of you that have experienced things or you've just said, I just, I just want to be dead. He doesn't want you to stay in that kind of brokenness anymore. He, he's here to heal your heart today if you'll trust him with it. So you have a choice to make. No matter who or what is the cause of your pain, and it will determine what your future looks like. It'll determine if you continue limping through life or if you're able to rise up, to be healed, to, to see God's restoration on the inside of you so that you can live and walk in victory. 
If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and forgive your sin, you can do that today and you can start a new life. And he'll wash you clean. The Bible says in 1 John it says that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a good feeling to feel clean, to know that nobody's holding your sins against you anymore. At least God isn't. Sometimes reconciliation on earth takes take some time. So you can do that today. If you want to ask Jesus to be your Lord and wash away your sin and heal your broken heart, he'll do that for you today. Or if you were like me, you already had a relationship with the Lord, but you didn't know how to trust him with your heart. You were still just stuck in brokenness and hopelessness. Then you can choose to fully trust him with your heart today and ask him to start healing you. Ask him to show you what you need to do to get up and go. To, to start moving in the direction of healing and hope. And so um, we're going to sing this worship song, Grave in, Graves into Gardens. And um, Johnny Mack and Jeannie Brown are going to come forward. And um, we just want to pray with you today. If you fall into either of those categories, if you know that you need Jesus to forgive your sin and give you a fresh start, you can do that today. Or if you just are stuck in brokenness and you need God to heal you you know God is saying to you today how long are you going to mourn then I believe that the Lord is here to minister to you today would you close your eyes with me Father I just pray that you would help us to fully trust you with our hearts Anybody here, Lord, that doesn't know you, that needs to know and experience the forgiveness and the and just the cleanness of being washed clean, of not having our sins held against us, Lord, let them receive you today. And anybody here that's just dealing with brokenness and hopelessness, Lord, I just speak life into them today in Jesus' name. Lord. Thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for giving us hope. Thank you that you still have good plans for us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay, if, if any one of you still with your eyes closed, if any one of you, I'm, I am going to ask you to come forward to receive prayer, uh, but is there anybody here who you need to say, I've never asked Jesus to live in my heart, and I want to do that today. I want to ask him to forgive my sin and wash me clean. Is there anybody here that would like to do that today? Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be a good day. All right. Is there anybody here? Anybody who you're, you're, uh, we're going to pray for you in just a minute. Okay. We got you. Anybody here who you're, you love God. You're trying to serve God, but you feel like you're just stuck in your brokenness and you want God to heal you today, to help you to start on the path to restoration. Would you raise your hand if you know that's you today? Okay. As we worship, as we worship, I just ask you to come. Come pray with us. Johnny Mack will pray with you, okay? And um, Jeannie and I will pray with any of you women who just want God to heal your heart also. And um, I believe that the Holy Spirit is here to do that today. So thank you, Lord. Y'all, why don't you stand up on your feet, worship with us. And, you know, even if you didn't raise your hand, if you just need prayer, you come. You come. the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough when you came
give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways you're the only one who can Oh, there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing, nothing is better than you You turn morning you turn morning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You're the only one who can Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you Nothing is better than you. Sing it loud, church. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. stage with me, Mercedes. Mercedes um, has a word for us today. It, it's good. Yes. Okay. So, uh, hi. I was reading this yesterday on our way home from Dallas, and it just flew off the page. And today, the Lord just, he really dropped it in my heart. And this is in Isaiah, it's in Isaiah 7, and he's talking to Isaiah, he's telling him to tell these things to King Ahaz, right? Or Ahaz, or however you say his name. And it says, this is the Lord speaking, right? And he says, unless your faith is firm, I cannot make you stand firm. And so I just want to ask, like, where is our faith today? And um, if our faith is faith, is like nothing maybe we should be asking the lord to increase our faith in him because that's the only way he can make us stand firm is if is if our faith is firm in him and it kind of goes along with trusting in him and trusting him with our hearts so yeah yeah that's good good job thank you mercedes so good here ashlyn um yeah so good thank you for sharing mercedes well, I feel like the Lord has met us here today, and I'm so thankful, and I just, um, yeah, I'm just thankful that God is so good. He really is, and he's gentle and kind, and he's patient with us, and, um, you know, he really does heal our broken hearts and, and restore us like we were never broken. What, that's one thing the Lord said to me um, one time was, I'm going to restore you, Lacey, and it's going to be like you were never broken. And, um, you know, I think I'm better now. I'm better than, than before I was broken. <laughs> he used all of the hard things that, that I've been through for good in my life for sure. So, um, so I'm thankful for that. So, yeah, y'all can be seated real quick. We are 
um, almost done with our service, but I do want to take a moment to um, receive the Lord's tithe in your offering and just tell you thank you, thank you, thank you for all of um, your generous giving. And I think Pastor Connie shared this um, a week or two ago, but at the start of 2020, before you know, we knew that all hell was going to break loose in the world, um, Pastor Connie gave us a word at PMT, which is our pastor's management team meeting that we have every Tuesday. And she said, you know, I just felt like the Lord showed me that we are step, we are moving out from having to rely on miracle provision and God is moving us into our promised land. And, um, you know, we saw that be true, even in the middle of the pandemic, even when so many other churches were struggling, so many other businesses were struggling financially, God was faithful, and y'all were faithful to give and to tithe and to make it possible for us to continue to reach out to a hurting world. And so I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for your generous giving. And um, I want to pray over your giving today. If you, all the different ways that you can give are on the screen. Um, if you have cash or a check, you can use one of the envelopes that's in the seat next to you and you can put that um, in the bucket at the back of the church and that will be great. So let me pray. Father, I just thank you for every giver, Lord. I just thank you that you're a generous God, Lord, and, and that you love it when people are generous. Lord, you love a cheerful giver. And Lord, I just declare your word over these people today that every time they give, Lord, you give back to them. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will men give into their hands. Lord, I just thank you for providing for them. Lord, I just pray that every, every giver, Lord, that you would supply all all their need according to your riches and glory. And I thank you for that promise, Lord. I just thank you that um, when we follow you, Lord, that, that we can trust you to be our provider and the source of everything that we need. And I thank you for that, Lord. I pray that you would bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.